Saint Vincent Bearer, Saint Jude, Lady Victory, Lady of Sorrows, Lady of Christians, and Ignatius. So today, just a few considerations as we begin this um, you know, three hours of uh, during the time of this three hours of preparing for Mass the priest sanctify. Contemplation on Good Friday. And last night, just a little mentioning of Judas, the reality of Judas, and that one thing that Saint Augustine tells us is that every every type of person is present at the cross. No one misses the cross. Everyone is there. And uh, Judas, the traitor, was there. And the main people we consider on the Passion are three individuals who watch the Passion. One was Judas who is filled with Satan. In fact, they mentioned three times in the Gospel that Satan entered him. Satan in him, the first time it's mentioned, he's called the traitor, which is when our Lord Jesus Christ prophesied the real presence, when he prophesied the, the sacrifice of the, of the cross of the Mass, the sacrifice of the Mass. When he, when he, when he um, cure, multiplied the 5,000, the bread for the 5,000, he said, and the next day he said, eat my flesh, drink my blood, or you shall not have life in you. And at, on that next day he said, eat my flesh, drink my blood, or you shall not have life in you. And all the apostles were there. The people were scandalized because he said this, and all the people left. So many left that Christ said to his 12 apostles, will you leave me also? And St. Peter said, to whom shall we go? St. Peter did not understand what our Lord had to say, but he said, to whom shall we go? He didn't understand the, the real presence of the the body and blood of Christ and the, under the species of bread and the species of wine. He couldn't understand that at all. But he did not want to leave Christ. And then it says in the Gospel, and Judas the traitor was there. Judas the traitor was there. And here Bishop Sheen says that the priest began his betrayal. Judas began his betrayal. He began his betrayal at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. He began his betrayal by walking away from the, holy, the belief in the essence of the Holy Eucharist, which is the victim dying for our sins. No one has a problem with Christ being praised, Christ being glorified, Christ being popular. But we have a great problem with Christ suffering. And so therefore, Judas betrayed Christ. He was called a traitor for the first time. Then, at the time, that St. Mary Magdalene pours alabaster oil on the feet of our Lord on Wednesday of Holy Week, or possibly on Friday before the raising of, uh, of Lazarus, or after the raising of Lazarus on Saturday. But on that day, she poured the holy oil on his feet, and he said, to what purpose is this waste? This could have been given to the poor. And the evangelist says, and Satan entered into him, and he was scandalized. Three levels of the scandal of Judas. First, Judas was shocked because Christ did not do what he was supposed to do. Christ was, came to be the king. Christ came in order to rule the, the Jewish people in a kingdom of peace, to conquer all the enemies. And it says very clearly in sacred scripture, it says very clearly, Christ is going to reign until the end of time. He is going to have a rule that shall have no end. And there, therefore, now he's got the opportunity. He just gave bread to 5,000. And he comes to the, the next day after praying all night in the mountain. Very beautiful that Christ prayed last night in the mountain. And that he prayed because he now he knows it's time to begin his ministry. And he gives up to preach a sermon. And Judas is waiting for a powerful sermon. And Christ says, If you do not eat my flesh, if you do not drink my blood, you shall not have life in you. And they said, are you talking about cannibalism? We're going to eat your flesh and drink your blood? We're going to murder you and then eat your flesh and drink your blood? That's insane. And he repeated, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not have life in you. Three times he said it. And the people were shocked and scandalized. Judas being the most scandalized of all. It was then that Judas betrayed Christ in his heart. Later on, he would steal money. Later on, he would sell Christ for the price of a slave, which is 30 pieces of silver. Later on, he would lead a mob to Christ in the night. Then he would complete the betrayal by betraying him with a kiss. 
But this was the phase one. Judas was simply scandalized. He's the first one to really fulfill the prophecy of St. Simeon. When St. Simeon said to the mother of God, as he held the little baby in his arms, this child shall be for the rise and fall of many. We understand the child shall be for the rise of many, but how can he be for the fall? But our Lord Jesus Christ is not only for the good of some, he's also for the bad of others. Some will meet Christ evil, and they will return good. But others will meet Christ good, and they will turn evil. This child shall be for the fall of many. There will be many people, had they not met our Lord Jesus Christ, they would have been good men. They would have lived good lives. They would have died a nice, peaceful, good death. One such man was Judas from Cariot. He was a good man. He was beyond reproach, not only on the outside, he was also beyond reproach in his heart. When he met Christ, he was a good man. Whereas Simon, when he met Christ, he was a sinner. When Simon said to our Lord Jesus Christ, after seeing the miracle of the fishes, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. He was not being pious. He was just telling the truth. Simon was a sinful man. He was not pious. He was a sailor. He cursed like a sailor. He acted like a sailor. He was rough. He was not religious. He only cared about his business. And a saint and a prophet came to him and multiplied fish. But he didn't think about the money he would make off of that fish. He rather thought a good representative of God. He did not know that Jesus Christ was God at this time, but he knew he was a prophet. Depart from me because I am a sinful man. And our Lord said, no, I will not depart from you. I will make you a fisher of men. You sinful man, follow me. And in case there be any doubts about the sinfulness of Peter, he will be the one that will curse and swear he doesn't know the man. He was really a sinful man. But after three and a half years with Christ, after being with the Blessed Virgin Mary, he became a saint and he rose. Judas was the other side of the coin. When he met Christ, he was genuinely a good man. And he was faithful. He was holy. He was pious and genuinely pious. But he had his own ideas about what our Lord Jesus Christ was about. He wanted to be a part of the kingdom of Christ's victory. He wanted to be part of that. He didn't want to miss out. And then our Lord scandalized him one time too many. And our Lord Jesus Christ would repeat the words that was in the prophecy of St. Simeon. Simeon said when the child was a little boy, only 40 days old, this child shall be for the rise and fall of many. And then our Lord said 30 years later, Blessed is he that is not scandalized in me. And St. Paul would repeat later on in his epistles, he's a stumbling block, a scandal, a stumbling block, the word for Greek, the word for stumbling block in Greek is scandal. He shall be a scandal to the Jews. This man is a scandal, he's a stumbling block. And why is he a stumbling block? What is a stumbling block? When we're on our way to a destination, you're walking somewhere and there's a block in the way that trips you and makes you fall so you don't achieve your destination. To achieve, to achieve the destination. When he goes to the destination, he's blocked. Judas was blocked from his destination. And many a good man is blocked by Christ. Remember speaking to two old um, abbots of monasteries. Well, three of them, actually. Three different man abbots of monasteries who did not know each other. One was in his 80s. Another one was a young man in his 50s. And then there was another one maybe around the same age. The three didn't really know each other. 
And each of them told me, we often find the romantic seminarian and the romantic monk. They come to the monastery and they want to be holy monks. And they have in their mind what it means to be a holy monk. They know that if you come to the monastery, you're going to go paint lashes and give yourself 40 lashes on the back and you're going to say spiritual things. You're not going to hear anybody saying bad language. You're not going to have any hot tempers. Priests don't try to kill each other. I remember when I was in the, the seminary, my first time, I was almost head waiter. We, are, we go by hierarchy. And uh, so the, one, my classmate of mine was six months older than me. So he was the head waiter. And we had two young seminarians, actually both older than myself and the other seminarian, but we were ahead of them years because we were advanced. And they were, one of them was the most lazy individual on the planet, and the other one was even more lazy than him. We could never decide which one was most lazy. And they were big, strong, tough guys. And one of them said, one was from Africa, one was from America, and they said, you know, he said, pick that glass up. You pick that, that glass up. No, you pick that glass up. And a fist fight broke out. Two guys in a cassock. <laughs> so I talked to the head waiter. I said, Steve, you're the head waiter. <laughs> Break up those guys. He says, I don't care if they kill each other. They're both lazy bums. They're both trying to kill each other over a glass. What do I care? <laughs> we'll let them kill each other. So he walked away. And I said, well, I'm the number two in charge, but I don't care either. <laughs> so I walked away. And so they started to kill each other. And they were really killing each other. One of them was now a priest. The other one didn't make it. Finally, some guys, other seminarians came before priests showed up. And people started getting expelled. They pulled them off each other. They're trying to kill each other over a glass because they were both lazy. That doesn't happen in seminaries. That's not supposed to happen. These things don't happen in religious houses. You're not supposed to have unspiritual people. How can it be that here I am amongst all the apostles, says Judas, and this guy, James and John, James and John, who say they're friends of Peter. John is Peter's closest friend. Everybody knows it. How close of a friend is John to Peter? Because he just had his mother go to Christ and say, Lord, when you take over, since John's your favorite apostle and James is his brother, can you make James and John the number one and the number two apostles? What does that mean about Pete? Bye-bye, Pete. You can be friends and you can be in charge. I'd rather be in charge and I'll dump, dump on my friend. And the one that dumped on his friend and stabbed him in the back, his name is St. John, the beloved apostle. He's the one that arranged the whole thing. And Judas was scandalized. Is this what, are these the men you chose to be apostles? And he was scandalized by other things too. You know the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I mean, they, some of them are good men. You have to admit they're not all like Caiaphas. Some of them are good men. But you keep curing people on the Sabbath when you know that they will be angry if you cure on the Sabbath. If you didn't cure on the Sabbath, they couldn't accuse you of curing on bad days. But he keeps curing on the Sabbath. I'll let it go. But then one day they were in the desert after over three years, almost two years, more than two years. And finally the people want to make him king. And these are not loser people. These aren't wicked people. These are the people that traveled three days without eating and sleeping. These are the traditional Catholics. These are the holy ones, the good ones, the ones that don't like the liberals, the ones that stood up against the Pharisees and Sadducees. And the Pharisees and Sadducees, the last of them left yesterday because he had to go get his food. He couldn't take three days without food. And now it's only 5,000 good people. You gave them the bread, not the Pharisees. Now it's time to be king. And the Lord Jesus Christ gave a bad sermon. He offended the people and drove them away. And Judas said, that's it. I've had enough. I've had enough. And he became the traitor. He fell. It would be some time before he became as wicked as he eventually would become. But he betrayed Christ. And how did it begin? Because Judas had one idea of what Jesus Christ was supposed to be. And the apostles, what they were supposed to be. 
First of all, they should be Judeans and not Galileans. Galileans are the crazy ones. They're the ones that are backwards. They're the old fishermen. These, aren't, these men aren't going to be respected. If you're going to go out and rule the world, get men with an education. Get men with a good background. Get men that are going to be respected by the people. Don't get fishermen. One day, St. Bernard of Clairvaux had one of his monks. He loved that monk. I forget his name, the name of the monk. But he became Pope Innocent the Eighth or Seventh, one of the Innocents. Or Innocent the First or Second. I think Innocent the Second he became. And he was on his way to Rome. He was a bishop. And Bernard wept. And he said, I know I will never see you again. He says, why am I? Why will you never see me again? Because you're going to go to Rome. When you arrive there, the Pope is going to die. They're going to elect you Pope. And when you become Pope, remember, you are the successor of a fisherman. You are not the successor of a noble. Don't forget you're the successor of a fisherman. You will become Pope, and I will never see you again before I die. But do not forget what a Pope is, a successor of a fisherman. Our dignity is in Christ, and our dignity is to be in the representative of God, and our dignity is not in our humanity, but Judas couldn't understand that. Judas made a lot of sense. Judas was very wise. He was following the wisdom that made a lot of sense of his father, who is called the devil, who two, four thousand years before Christ was born, Satan was showed, Lucifer, Lucifer means light carrier. He's a great carrier of light, the most intelligent and the wisest and highest of all the angels, that all the angels, and there are billions and billions and billions of angels, that all the angels look up to, the carrier of light. And God showed to the carrier of light and all the other angels, I am going to become man. A very low creature, the lowest of all the intellectual creatures. He is the highest of all the physical creatures, but he's the lowest of all the intellectual creatures. He's right in the middle. And that makes no sense, because God likes the best, and he likes the worst. But he can't stand the ones in the middle. So why on earth would he become one of the ones in the middle? It makes no sense. And God will humble himself. And Lucifer explained to the angels how foolish it was for God to become a man. And he wanted to know why. I want an explanation. <coughs> now Lucifer has been in existence for about two seconds at the time. He was gifted with a great intellect. The greatest of all intellects God ever gave to any creature. And he wanted an explanation. He wanted to understand. And that was the beginning of his downfall. Our Lord explained to him, I am going to become man to save the human race because when Adam is becoming man, he's going to fall. And I'm going to save the human race. I'm going to become king of all men and king of all creation. But it didn't make sense to Lucifer. His spirit entered Judas before Judas really became Judas. Judas in phase one. Judas who says he understands what the spiritual life is all about. He knows what God is supposed to do. He knows the direction that God is going in, and as he's walking on the way, God himself puts a stumbling block, a scandal in the way, and he trips. Who's to blame for the tripping? The one that put the scandal. The Lord Jesus Christ is a scandal. This is a dogma of our faith. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Blessed is he that is not scandalized in me. He will do something that's a scandal. And it was not only a scandal to Judas, it was also a scandal to Simon Peter. Because after he was told he was going to be the head of the apostles, just after that, when he said, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood is not revealed to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. <coughs> Immediately after that, he said, the Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem and be crucified and die more than a year before he died. And now that Simon Peter was the head of the apostles, he said, Lord, you can't be crucified. It's wrong for you to be crucified. And therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ said to Simon Peter, to him in his face, Get behind me, Satan. He called Simon Peter Satan 
because Simon Peter thought Christ would not be a victim Christ. And Christ would not be, should not be, a crucified Christ. And Christ should not be a Christ, a Christ who spit upon and scourged and crowned with thorns. It's wrong for Christ to be that way. And therefore, St. Peter says, it's wrong. And our Lord yelled at him and said, get behind me, Satan. You don't lead me, I lead you. And, and St. Peter wept. And he said, I never want to be called Satan by Christ again. I don't ever want that to happen again. I will follow him, but I don't want to be called Satan by Christ again. I don't want that to happen. Peter began to change, though he did not understand. Judas did not understand. Also, both Peter and Judas did not understand. But Peter said, I don't want to be called Satan again. I don't ever want to have our Lord Jesus Christ angry with me like that again. And I don't care if I don't understand, I'm going to stay with him. And Judas said, I don't believe Jesus Christ said that. It makes no sense. He had an opportunity to explain, and now he tells me have faith. He wants me to just obey. This is unacceptable. Both Simon Peter and Judas Iscariot misunderstood Jesus Christ, and they both thought he was wrong. But they didn't have the same reaction. Both would deny him on Holy Thursday night. And once again, they would not have the same reaction. The Holy Mother Church wants us to consider especially Judas and St. Peter on this night. Between last night and today. Because all of us misunderstand Christ. We all think he's going one way. But maybe he's going another we all think we know which way is up, but we do not know the way. And so we misunderstand. We are all going to do that. But what's going to happen after we misunderstand? St. Peter said, though I don't understand, I'm not going to go anywhere else. I'm not turning anywhere else. I am staying with him. And Judas said, he better give me a better explanation. I'll take time to think about it. I'll take time to meditate on it. And I'll try to see if I missed something. But I look carefully over all of my notes. And I know very well all the, all the 46 books of the Old Testament. And I know the history of the martyrs and the saints of the Old Testament. And none of them would accept this kind of death. And none of them would speak. Elias didn't speak like that. Remember one day Elias was on top of a mountain. And soldiers came to him and said, Elias, you're under arrest. And Elias said, excuse me? And fire came from heaven and killed them all. That's what Elias did. And then 50 soldiers came the second time. And they said, Elias, you're under arrest. And he said, excuse me? And fire came from heaven and killed all 50 of them. And finally, Achab sent a hundred soldiers, and the, hundred, and, the, and the centurion and the head of the hundred soldiers said, Elias, you're not under arrest. Please don't kill us. Achab wants to see you. And Elias said, well, you only had to ask. <laughs> Elias, who was only a prophet, did not accept disrespect. And his disciple, Elias, he was bald-headed. And one day, boys came to him and said, Go up, thou bald head. And they made fun of the prophet for being bald-headed. And lions came out of the woods and killed them. But this man says he's the Messiah. They were only prophets about the Messiah. And he says he's the Messiah. And he says, Kill me and eat my flesh. The Pharisees mock him, and he doesn't do anything about it. Occasionally, he calls them whited sepulchers. And he has an opportunity to stand up against him, and he doesn't do it. How can this man be the Messiah? It makes no sense. Now, I'm not going to give up right away. I want to give him a chance. But then, when he finally made that terrible mistake of saying, Eat my flesh and my blood, he gave up. Judas gave up on Christ. What about St. Peter? He said, Lord, I don't understand either. 
But to whom shall we go? Thou alone has the words of eternal life. And he stayed with Christ. He remembered he was called Satan only a short time ago and never wanted that to happen again. He never wanted Christ to be angry with him like that again. And so he said, I don't understand either, but I'm not going anywhere. I want to stay with you. Now we come forward to Holy Thursday, Holy Wednesday, and the final straw. It's interesting what the final straw is. It's always the same. Solomon said, the more things change, the more they remain the same. There's nothing new under the sun. And the sacred scripture tells us money is the root of all evil. Whenever we quote that, people always say, that's what it says. It says the love of money. Say it right. Money is something only human beings can have. It has no value unless it has love. Money is the root of all evil. Our human attachment to it is the beginning of everything. St. Augustine says, why are there heretics? And why do they invent heresies? Because it gives them profit. Because they get glory and they get profit from it. No one would believe their stupid teaching, except their stupid teaching placates consciences. You used to go to a priest once upon a time when you were bad. Father, my bad? Yes. Next question. Am I evil? Yes. What else should I do about the fact that I'm with 12 husbands and I murder people on the weekend? Stop! <laughs> You're not nice. <laughs> and if you stop, I will give you absolution. And if you change, you will have peace. Try that with a psychiatrist sometime. Now you pay the psychiatrist 100 bucks a minute. <laughs> and you go to the, I'm a murderer. Well, you know, people feel like being murdering sometimes. I do, too. <laughs> and then I, I have 12 husbands. Well, you know, it's, that's good. That's good. You love more than others. Some women only love one man. How constrictive is that? You love 12. You have a greater love. Okay, how about another pay? More money. Why do they say stupidities? Because it makes cash. Because it makes popularity. It's the root of all evil, says so sacred scripture. It's where it begins. Where does it end? Judas was already in the state of mortal sin. Judas already hated God and was already given over to the devil. But when St. Mary Magdalene came into that room and took 300 denarii worth of alabaster oil, one year's wages, $30,000 bottle of oil. That's expensive Chanel number no. 5. 30,000 bucks for one bottle. For her, it was nothing. She was the richest woman in all of, of, of one of the richest women in all of, it, of, of Jerusalem. She was in crow of the whole town of Magdala. She was a multimillionaire. $30,000 for a bottle of olive oil was nothing for her. She was very wealthy. She was a sister of Saint of Lazarus. That is why also we know Mary Magdalene was so wicked. Because traditionally, when a girl becomes a prostitute, it's because of poverty. And very often, the parents send the girl to be a prostitute to bring in money for the, for the family. Or to become a prostitute just to survive. But Mary Magdalene was exceedingly wealthy. She had no need to become a prostitute. It was pure maliciousness, maliciousness of heart and pure wickedness that made her a prostitute. She was exceedingly evil. But when she heard Christ talk about the prodigal son, and when she saw that Christ came to take away sins, she wept, and her tears wiped away all her sins, and then there were things that didn't mean anything to her anymore. And somehow her heart told her, I must pour this ointment upon Christ. But Judas knew two things about it. Where did that alabaster oil come from? Her evil trade. And what is it for? For evil. And it could have been sold and given to the poor. That was the final straw when Satan entered, uh, into, entered Judas in a way that he would never repent. Because Christ wasted money. Always the same. Never changes. When they attacked the Catholic Church, 
They say, look at all those cathedrals. Look at all those big, huge cathedrals. They spent all these millions of dollars on these cathedrals. It was wasted money that could have been given to the poor. St. John Vianney never had enough money for food. You get one potato a week, a week, and that was enough. Never had enough money for his cassock to replace his cassock. But he only bought the most expensive chalices that could be purchased. He only bought the best vestments. And he wouldn't allow anything except the best on the altar of God because it was for God. And then he always had room for someone else in the orphanage, young girl in the orphanage, though he didn't have money to feed them and take care of them. But he knew Our Lady and, 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 and St. Philomena would take care of it, and they did. As we travel with Christ, we will discover we are sinners as we met him. We will discover until the day of death that we are still sinners. But though we are sinners, what happens in our hearts? For some sinners, their hearts become hardened, though their sins don't seem so bad. And other sinners, their hearts become softened, and they change their direction, though their sins may or may, their sins may, or may not seem so bad. Judas finishes his betrayal of Christ. And he finishes it by the scandal of wasted money. Always the same. They say the Catholic Church. You can look, you can get these books, beautiful books, with pictures of all the basilicas and cathedrals in Europe. And all the beautiful art. And you look at the beautiful pictures. But if you are stupid enough to take time to read the words around the pictures... They always say the same thing in these beautiful art books. You can get them. Now, of course, everything is available on the Internet. You used to buy these big, huge books, beautiful pictures of all the cathedrals and all the basilicas, Romanesque architecture, Gothic architecture. And it says, these beautiful buildings were built so that the priests could make all kinds of money. And they would sell indulgences. And then they would make relics. And you get more money if you go to one church and you get the, have, have these relics in it. And more money in another church you get those relics in it. And they said it was all only about money. And they could not understand that the poor people that built those things only built them because they wanted to go to a place called heaven. And they built them out of the love of God and with faith. The modern man cannot understand that because the spirit of Judas is already deep in the heart of the average man today. There are many Judases in our times. To what purpose is this waste? <clears throat> Why doesn't our Lord use his, use his talents? Why doesn't he use his gifts? Why doesn't he drain people in with honey rather than telling them about eating his flesh and drinking his blood? Why is he acting the way he acts? <clears throat> now Judas changes. And it says, And from that moment on, he sought how he would betray him. He searched for a way to betray Christ. He had to find a way. They didn't look for Judas. Caiaphas wasn't looking for Judas. Annas wasn't looking for Judas. They thought, this man is such a powerful speaker. This man is such a powerful miracle worker that surely none of his apostles could be, could be, could be infiltrated. You couldn't infiltrate the apostles. They know that this man, Jesus Christ, they don't believe he's God, but they know he understands people, and they know he can't be deceived, and so they didn't even try to betray the 12, to get the 12 apostles to betray. They thought you couldn't break into that college. And one day, one of the most famous of all the apostles, the only one that was a Judean outside of Jesus Christ himself, the one that was beyond reproach came to them and said, What will you give me if I betray him? What will you give me? And it's interesting, the price. What will you give me? And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. Bishop Sheen says, commenting on this, he says, You know the trouble of betraying Christ? It's not so bad to betray him. The problem is we betray him too cheap. We get too little for it. When a man of the world wants to betray a king, he wants a big paycheck. He wants a massive amount. He wants a, a, an estate. He wants something serious, or he will not do the betrayal. But the trouble with betraying Christ, we betray him so cheap. 
a priest leaves the priesthood for a few thousand nights in bed. He leaves the priesthood for a few dollars. He leaves the priesthood for a little bit of fame, for a few moments. And burns forever for what? We betray Christ too cheap. And it's interesting also, the value of Christ. Why do we betray him so cheap? Because in the mind of those who betray Christ, when they reach the straight stage of Judas, they believe that Jesus Christ is worthless. Every one of us has things around our house. You sell for 10 bucks at a yard sale. If you get 20, that's a pretty good deal. If you get 30 pieces of silver, that's a really good deal. You know what they've been doing the last 50 years since Vatican II? They've been selling Jesus Christ at yard sales. He's available in thrift shops. You can pick him up for free. When I was a child in the 70s and 80s, I used to go around to places and we would find statues of our Lord Jesus Christ and crucifixes. They were in garbage cans. I used to go to churches and they would give them to me for free. I didn't have to pay for anything. One time I went to a church at the age of 16 and I saw the big pontifical vestments, beautiful, man-made, magnificent pontifical vestments. That's for the bishop saying pontifical mass. That's a chasuble. That's five dalmatics. And, and then it's four, four copes plus two copes to the bishop and the other one, and then plus all the accoutrements. And, it's, and it was made for, for a Pope Pius XII. He was going to visit Kentucky in 1939. Cardinal Bocelli was going to visit Kentucky, visit the oldest church there in seminary. He was going to do a pontifical mass in our old little church of St. Thomas in Bardstown, Kentucky, the first seminary west of the Allegheny, the first seminary of the West. He built special vestments for it, but he canceled the trip because Pius XI died and he was elected Pope. So since he was elected Pope, he canceled the trip for some reason. Never came. So the vestments were never used. They sat there till the 1980s. I saw them, and these were made for Pope Pius XII, who never used them. They never used for a single mass. I was going to get them and bring them. He was the priest, so I gave them to me for free. 16-year-old kid. And then he found out, is this going to be used for the Latin Mass? Is this going to be used for the glory of God? He took the vestments, gave them to a lady that we all know from our, on our place there in Kentucky, that chopped these up and turned them into play clothes. They cut them in bits. If you have any familiarity with the vestments of a priest, they're thick. They're beautiful, but they're thick. They're not very good for play clothes. So they chopped them in bits and then threw them away. Because it was worthless. And the crucifixes were worthless. And the statues are worthless. And Christ is worthless. So if you get 30 pieces of silver, that's a pretty good deal. What is valuable to us changes as we turn away from Christ. Our values change. So he was going to get 30 pieces of silver. What will you give me if, if I betray God? What will you give me if I betray your worst enemy? You're willing to give me millions of dollars. You're willing to give me thousands of denarii. What will you give me? And Caiaphas, the wise Jew, this guy is an idiot. He should be saying, I won't betray him unless you make me a high priest next to you. I won't betray him unless you give me a building and an estate. I won't betray him unless you feed me several thousand denarii every year for the rest of my life. I won't betray you unless you give me such and such dukedoms and kingdoms and make me a special uh, envoy to Rome. That's what I require, or I will not betray him. And they would pay. But they were dealing with an idiot. When priests turns against God, they're always idiots. They have the most powerful thing in their hands. When they were made priests, their hands were consecrated, and it said, the bishop said, What these hands bless, let it be blessed. What these hands consecrate, let it be consecrated. These are the most powerful hands. And what happens to the hands of our Judas? He made them filthy with money, filthy with impurity, filthy with the, the ways of the world. And all of a sudden, Christ is not so valuable anymore. 
30 pieces of silver was the price of a slave, a cheap slave, one that doesn't have any competence or talent. Somebody can just clean the floors and maybe wash the dishes, and that's about it. And it said in the book of Jeremiah, they prized me the price of a slave, and they sold me for 30 pieces of silver. And so Caiaphas said, I'll give you 30 pieces of silver for this slave. And Judas said, that much? I'll take it. And both Judas and Caiaphas should have known that's the wrong amount to give. They should have known that. Because it was a prophecy that Christ would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. There was a prophecy that said, they have sold, they will sell me for 30 pieces of silver. Prizing the size of the slave. So he should have given 31. He should have given 29. But he remembered 30. It was a familiar number in his head. He couldn't remember why it was familiar. And then, of course, the slave is worth 30 pieces of silver. And that man, Jesus Christ, he's barely worth the price of a slave. I'll give you 30 pieces of silver. And so they gave him 30 pieces of silver. And he put it in his pocket. When Judas was ordained a priest, there were 30 pieces of silver in his pocket. When the Lord Jesus Christ put hands upon his head and made him a priest, when he said to them, as often as you do these things, you should do them in commemoration of me. And he gave him the power to make Christ present. Judas the priest had 30 pieces of silver in his pocket. But why? It wasn't just 30 stolen dollars. It was his thought of the value of Jesus Christ. The Jewish used to say, Judas, who knew the price of everything and the value of nothing. The Lord Jesus Christ were 30 pieces of silver. The same Judas, only a few days before, said, this is worth 300 denarii, about 10 times what our Lord is worth. That's worth 300 denarii, whereas Jesus Christ is only worth 30 pieces of silver. And so Judas is depth, is totally in the state of Satan inside of him. Comes back to the Last Supper. And he's looking for a way to betray him. And he has a plan. He has a plan. He knows the ways of Christ. He knows the way Christ travels. He knows how he stops in the garden to get 70 at night. He knows the secret alleys Christ walks around. Because Lord Jesus Christ is very popular. And sometimes he didn't want to be around the people. So instead of going on the main streets, he'd go down certain side alleys so he wouldn't be bothered. He knew those side alleys. So Judas said, don't worry. There's a certain side alley in Jerusalem where he always walks. There's never anyone there. Set your mob there and capture him there. And I will point out to you which one is him. But the Lord Jesus Christ didn't want to be captured in Jerusalem. So on, Jerusalem, on that night of Thursday, he had a plan. God's plans don't take very long to formulate. And they destroy all our plans. It's good to remember in our time of the surveillance state, many people, are, you know, when you get your wallet, you make sure in your wallet you got your little credit card. It's got a chip in it that can be read by the satellites. But they put aluminum foil around it. The satellite can't see it. The satellite can see. There's 5,000 people in this little town of Fullerton on this block, and one moron has aluminum foil around his wallet. That's the moron. Get him. You make yourself more visible. We are going to find a way to be secure. How are we going to hide when all the computers are looking for us? They have such a plan. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am going to have a dinner with my apostles. I am going to be with them, and I'm going to make them priests and bishops, and I'm going to give them the Holy Eucharist, and I'm going to tell them the New Testament. But Judas is trying to stop it with his plan. How does he stop it? Very simply. He tells Peter, James, and John, our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Peter, James, and John, go into Jerusalem. And walk down the streets. Which streets? Just walk down the streets. And you will see a man with a water pot upon his head. Only girls carry water pots on their head. But you're going to walk around see hundreds of girls with water pots on their head until you see some idiot whose wife is a feminist, and she won't wear the water bottle. You carry the water bottle on your head. See how it feels, okay? 
Yes, dear. Like in a have a fight with a, with a woman and man, have a fight in a good marriage. They said the man always says the last two words. Yes, dear. So, another abused husband. The wife will not carry the water pot on her head. So, I'll go and get it, dear. I'll get the water today, dear. And she went out to get the water. You will see a man with a water pot on his head. Follow him. When he goes to a certain house, that's the house where I want to stay. Tell him the Lord has need of the house. Now go upstairs in that house, in the upper room, in the tentacle, and prepare everything for the supper. Judas couldn't stop that plan. What's the guy? What's his name? What's he look like? You walk into a town with 300,000 people walking the streets looking for a guy with a water pot. What if there's two fruitcakes in the water pot? <laughs> How do you know which one? Which street do you walk down? And you find a guy with a water pot and you chase him to his house and Judas' uh, mob waited and waited and waited. They said he always comes down this alley. Why is he coming down this alley today? His plan was thwarted. It's not that hard for God. He said, I'm all eternity to think. He doesn't even have to think. The Blessed Virgin Mary, she knew the Lord Jesus Christ must be born in Bethlehem. She also knew her husband was a stubborn carpenter. And he didn't like traveling. And they lived in Nazareth. Did she say, Dear Angel Gabriel, can you remind Joseph that we need to go to Nazareth in the next nine months? Can you make sure we show up in Nazareth? And imagine what she'd be like if she was a modern girl. Joseph. Nazareth's really, their Bethlehem is really nice this time of year. Don't you want to see your family? She didn't do that. Because she knew that God had a plan. And God knows how to fulfill his plan. And God has had all eternity to think about it. She didn't need to worry about it. Somehow they would get to Bethlehem. And just a few days before the child was about to be born, a decree came and said, you've got to go to Bethlehem, whether you want to go there or not. Well, I guess we're going to Bethlehem. And so they went to Bethlehem. The mother of God, the wisest of all creatures God ever made, she didn't know how Christ was going to get to Bethlehem. But she didn't worry. God has a time to figure it out. And if the enemies want to bring us down, God can save us. And he can save us however he wishes. St. John of God was due not to be a martyr one particular day. And he was running away from soldiers. And he went into a house. He went into a crevice in a closet. And they searched all the closets and all the houses. And all of spiders came. A hundred spiders came. And they made a web right in front of him that filled the closet all the way up in front of him in a matter of minutes. And then the spiders left the soldiers came and saw a closet filled with spider web. Well, no one's been in this closet for years. They didn't want to grab the web and tear it away, so they left. He was saved by spiders. God knows how to do things. He's pretty wise. One day, Raymond of Penafort had to go to Spain, but he didn't have a boat. And the angel said, go to Spain from the island of Majorca. And he said, okay. So he took his cloak and he put it upon the water and he stood on his cloak. And three hours later, he was in Spain. That's faster than a modern speedboat. No boat can go that fast. And so, Judas had a plan. And it was foiled. Now he had to travel with Christ. He couldn't get away from the other apostles. And they arrived at the upper room. We must recognize that we are sinners like Judas was. Like Chris Peter was when he met Christ. Judas didn't know he was a sinner. He thought he was perfect. Judas was scandalized by Christ, then scandalized by money, and then he betrayed Christ. And he thought in his own heart, Christ will get away. He always does. And I got some extra cash for a worthless guy. God knows how to achieve what he wishes to achieve. And we must be aware of the spirit of Judas, which is more and more becoming part of the average man in our times. And... But Judas was betrayed. He never even got to spend his 30 pieces of silver. In any case, we'll close at that for the present. We'll go into the second rosary. And then we'll go ahead and say our prayers here. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Glory be to the Son, and the Holy Ghost.
Saint Vincent Ferrer, Saint Jude, Our Lady of Victory, Our Lady of Sorrows, Our Lady of Christians, Saint Ignatius.